Hello everyone and welcome back to the podcast. I'm your host, Ads Lyson. Before we get started with the podcast this week, if you want to get 15% off your surfing and outdoor gear, look no further, go to Northcore on the internet and use the code capital letters Grumpy Surfer 15 to receive 15% off your purchase. Also, the WaveKey guys, i.e. Brad Gerlach, has given me a 10% code to use until the 1st of July. Use the code WaveKey Grump to receive 10% off your subscription for your WaveKey technique from Brad Gerlach. Right, here we go then. My guest today is the epitome of what surfing is all about. He started his life in South Africa with his brother Angus and then travelled around the world to find himself in the United Kingdom. There they decided they needed to find some money that could fund their surf travel so they started a clothing company and that clothing company turned out to be one of Britain's biggest surf brands, Salt Rock. Subsequently after the last few years he and his brother decided to leave Salt Rock and now they have started an eco-friendly and sustainable clothing brand called Threadfin. So please enjoy my conversation with a legend, Ross Thompson. Ross Thompson, welcome to the podcast. How are you? Thank you very much. I'm I'm good. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for um, yeah the opportunity. It's really nice. So yeah. just explain where we are today and uh, what have you been doing today? So today I've been doing some design work um, with a new new brand, Threadfin. So uh, that seems to be the the order of the day at the moment is social media or graphics, new artwork. Um, we are set in what was the old, the original Salt Rock warehouse, which is now part soft play for a kid's playground, um, indoor play area, and a cafe. Um, and when my brother and I exited uh, Salt Rock, between exiting Salt Rock and starting up Threadfin, this was a, a new venture that we began. It's a really impressive place. I mean, the cafe that you've got out the front as well is, yeah. is pretty amazing. Yeah. I mean, we'll come on to talking about that uh, in a little sure. bit later yeah. on. But um, I just, I'm just going to just quickly throw out a little bit about your background, and then you can kind of fire into it a little yeah, bit. No so, sure. um, you and your brother. Uh, Angus were the founders of Salt Rock. That's right. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. So you did that for what, 10, 15 years? We started... Oh, 1988. 1988. So it's been some time. Yeah. Um, we started Salt Rock off the back of... We were traveling, really. Um, we left South Africa when I was 22. He was 23 to travel, um, see the world. You know, we we're at the age where even though South Africa, as incredible a country it is, and it's wave rich and culture rich... You know, when you live in a country and you're born in a country, it's still to us anyway, it was about getting out and seeing the world um, because you feel a bit sort of hemmed in. Um, and it, yeah, so, so, so we traveled. Um, we landed up in Penzance and uh, we, we were working sort of odd jobs for, for a couple of years, um, you know, just to fund our surf travels, picking daffodils. Uh, working uh, kitchen porter, all those kind of jobs for a couple of years. And then really after about two years of doing that, we both looked at each other and went, come on, you know, there's got to be something we can do. And obviously I've, I've always done art. Um, and my brother with his business studies, he's always been really good. Um, and we just put our heads together and, and started. We saw an opportunity. Um, at that time, surfing in the UK was... You know, it, it was embryonic, really. It, it was just starting to, to bubble. Um, if you compare, you know, Australia, America, even South Africa, the surf culture was already pretty big. And at that time, it was it was it was here for sure. But it was you could see it was definitely on the on the up. Um, and we we just put our heads together and said, yeah, let, let's start a let's start a surf brand. Um, you know, I can do the art, you can go sell the t-shirts and talk to the bank manager. Um, and that was it, as simple as that. Um, it was just a, a way of getting out the jobs we were doing. And, and it was really started to fund our surf travels. Simple. You know, we wanted to start a brand, sell t-shirts, just to, to continue traveling. Um, and, and Salt Rock was born in 1988 in a garage. It's crazy, especially the entrepreneurial side of things like that, just to fund your your traveling and stuff is is kind of something that I guess what 
every person that's really into surfing kind of dreams about? I mean, we, we didn't know anything about silkscreen printing. We didn't. So, so I, I had the artwork and I, I remember clearly the first print I did was a print called Little Creatures. And it's all, it was all dot work done with a rotring pen or rotring pen, fine dot work. And we had the artwork. Um, we'd, um, our, our gran had died and she had left us 500 pounds and that's what we started Salt Rock on, 500 pounds. And we bought the stock. We, we rented a garage so that was that was that was that, and then we needed a printer, and we hadn't done printing. Although I was a graphic designer, we hadn't actually learned the skill of silkscreen printing as such. And um, we went to a local printer in Penzance, and he just laughed at us. He was like, "You, you can't print that. That's too fine. The detail's too fine. You know, forget it, boys." You know. So we were no, we're not we're not going we're not going to have that. So we um, we went to the library and we got out books on printing, silkscreen printing, learned about silkscreen printing. And uh, and then we raided skips and tips, and we built a four color printer in in the garage, printed perfectly. Well, you built a printer. We built a print house. We built a print house. So we we got the wood, the metal um, from the local tip and skips. Uh, I mean, classic is I don't know if you know the process of silkscreen printing, but when you when you uh, print a T-shirt, obviously the ink is wet. It needs to be what's co- called cured. So it goes under a heater. Um, and it fixes the fixes the ink, so then it's it, it you can wear and wash it. Um, and we ha- we obviously we, we built the printer out of wood and metal um, and all the other bits we found and scrounged around and found all those bits, but we were a bit stumped with the with the curing. And then we um, we went to a Tip and we found an old uh, bank safe, a pretty big bank safe, and we converted it into into a curing unit. So we looked at that and went, okay, we, what we can do is we, we got tin foil and tin foiled the inside of it, put some dowels across, I think it could take three T-shirts at a time. We got a, a cooker um, oven element, put an ov- oven element in, um, and then put a timer on it and ba- baked our T-shirts. And it worked absolutely perfectly. Um, Mate, so, that is crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We got, yeah, it's, um, it was just patched together, but it, it worked we were we were producing we could we could cure three t shirts I think it was three or four I mean we burnt a few because we got we got the timing wrong, but we could we could cure three t shirts i think it took, i don't know how many minutes i can't remember um but we were we were producing hundreds of t shirts because we were out then selling on the road so that little that little um bank safe did us really well and it and it performed it was incredible. How did you learn how to put all the elements and stuff into something like? Did you go to a library and learn it, or did you yeah. have a little bit of a background in engineering? Just, just no background in engineering. Just, just sort of common sense, really. We, cause we, <laughs> we, because <laughs> we, we knew we knew the process. We'd learned the process of of curing a t shirt was it had to go under some sort of heated element, or well, and, and and it was normally on a you know on a roller, so the t shirts roll under under a certain amount of time, come out the other end, they they cured. So the theory. If you take that and go, okay, if we, if we hang them inside a, a unit that does the same thing, um, there'll be, a, you know, it'll, it'll take X amount of minutes. Like I say, there was a few T-shirts we burnt in the process, but we got to the optimum um, time um, and 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 worked it out and you know put them in, closed the door, put the timer on, ping, and they were done. You know, a couple, I think it was two and a half minutes, cooked, done, perfect to perfection. Where did the whole brand and the and the name Salt Rock come from? Is that something you'd thought about before? Or was it just something you developed as you're doing um, it? Well, Salt Rock is is actually a beach in South Africa, on the north coast of South Africa, and um, it's one of the places that we grew up. It's one of the places around where we surfed, um, and like like with Threadfin, you start with a list of names that you migrate, you know, names that you you like, and then it was just a case of you know slight elimination and salt rock was the one that just stuck it was the one that that had the energy it had the it just something about salt rock just stuck with us and and so it wasn't a science it was as simple as that it was like yeah it's a cool name that 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 works i guess maybe at the time you know we're also up against um you know quicksilver was was booming billabong mambo was big um and it was a name that we thought maybe had the energy to go up against the big boys, you know. And um, yeah, it was it was there was no science behind it. Much like Threadfin, there's no science. It, I think when you start a 
maybe some people wake up one day and go, I'm going to start a brand. They have one name. We've tended to have a few names that we that we like and then narrow it down to what we, we're comfortable that we, we want to go forward with, if you know what I mean. You're yeah. not fancy something like Fat Willies or something like that? Well, that... We, well yeah, <laughs> I, I, yeah, you say that, but our, we used to do trade shows when Salt Rock was in, in the early days and it was, uh, what was it, the, the board, no, it wasn't the Boardmasters, it was the Foster, was it the Fosters? Um, anyway, in Newquay and um, Fat Willies was there, um, you know, we used to set up our tent and sleep in the tent and, and trade and, you know, good good times, really good times, a lot of amazing times through Salt Rock, um, you know, building the brand through through the years. I mean, we when we exited, we built it up to a £20 million turnover, you know, and and that was from a garage. And what a journey, the people, the experiences, the travel we got out of it. Um, fantastic. You know, um, there's not a problem. It's um, what, what we did with that with that company and the people, you know, the team, the people we met. The, you know, it, such a journey. Really good. I yeah. think Salt Rock now has become quite an iconic British brand. And I mean, I know we're laughing about the, you know, Fat Willies. Mm. I don't know whether they're still going or not, but back when I was... You know, I was born in 1981, like we talked about. So I was seven when you started. So, you know, you had brands like Fat Willies and there were other, some, there were some other, you know, British brands knocking around like them. But, you know, you, you really did have, still have what you were saying before, Quicksilver, Billabong. Yeah. They were still like the, the main brands because the UK is such a small country, but we do produce some really good, you know, foreign distributional items, you know, yeah. T-shirts and stuff yeah. like that it's quite an iconic brand and for it to still be going now when yeah. a lot of things these days kind of tether out and go into the ether yeah. i think it's, it's it's such a cool thing and it yeah. just goes down to show that you know the people that are behind the brand you know you and your brother started it yeah. and the other people that are part of the brand as well yeah. have got the passion behind it to keep it going yeah exactly um when we when we started the brand it was it was it was I remember, I was talking to my brother about it not so long ago, I remember walking, you know, you, you've got to imagine this is a brand that nobody's heard of. So, so now people know the, know the name Salt Rock. They know the, the little logo, the little sitting tock and the we'll little running man. We'll talk about that in a minute. Yeah, uh, you know, that, that, is, that has become ingrained in people's psyche, which is great. But at the time, when I first designed that and we came up with a name and we walked into surf shops, we were laughed out the door. We were 100% just door shut. And it was a case of why would I buy a brand that I've never heard of um, when I've got a stockroom full of Quicksilver, you know, international brand, Billabong, international brand, Mambo, you know, and, and, and that's what you're up against when you start a brand. But you just got to, you know, we believed. We had the faith that, that there was something in it um, and that we'd, we'd, we'd get there. And all we had to do was get over the threshold, just get into a store, get our T-shirts there, and we knew we'd sell them. You know, we had the confidence there. So we were dyeing them ourselves. So the, the, not only did we print in the garage, we also dyed and tie-dyed ourselves. Um, so it was all, a, a, you know, a, a sort of homemade feel about it. And there's a lot of passion. There's a lot of passion. And I think that's the, that's the key is the, is the passion um, and the belief that, that it's going to do, even though you've got these big brands set up there and, and shopkeepers laughing out the door. Um, yeah, whatever, you know, we'll, we'll just keep going. Because we knew the minute we could get it in the door, we were confident it would sell, and it, and it did. You know, the minute we, we start off with one or two shops locally around Penzance, and then other shops get wind that oh, the brand's doing well, and then you know, and and slowly it starts to, you know, to multiply, and soon you're in you know, twenty stores, and then thirty stores, and then people start talking and seeing the brand, and it starts to you know self. Yeah, explode or whatever the word is where did the logo idea come from the little yogi guy with the surfboard and that um that that is a good question but i wanted at the time all the logos were waves you know they they they, they all had a wave icon um which is fine but I, I i just i've always been of the opinion that i wanted to do something completely different and to me the little sitting little top man um was uh, a, a kind of i think a surfing gives you a balance it's you know it's it's it kind of spirit and and and, and um surfing is good for your good for your head and, and and takes you to a good place and so the little top guy 
was developed with that kind of thinking of of a of a perfect sort of little balanced icon um but at the same time not wanting to follow what at the time all the big players were doing was just doing the obvious which was using a wave as their as their logo so i guess that's where it came from is is a, a form of just showing um yeah a bit of is a bit of zen you know a bit of balance was that supposed to be the like the brand icon you used or was it just something you drew naturally and then all of a sudden it turned out oh that's yeah. really cool it, it, it actually it's it's a, it's a funny it's a funny story because originally it was the running man i don't know if you remember the running man with the surfboard under with the surfboard yeah, under yeah. His arm. that was the original logo um but it was a complicated logo as in the detail and so I then re-looked and so that the little top guy is a version of, if you look at some of, you know, like the eye shape and the hair shape, it is one of the same, but it's a simplified version of the running man. So the running man was, was the hundred, I think a seagulls, um, a hundred, <laughs> um, a hundred percent the original logo, but it, it just, when you start getting into technical things like embroidery, um, where you're scaling your artwork down to be embroidered, then you, 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 you come across a lot of problems. So you have to start simplifying. So again, I didn't really know about that at the time. I was just, you know, I was just drawing and just art crazy. And, and, uh, and I produced it and it was great as a print, but it had problems down the line. Um, like I say, with embroidery and other, other embellishments. So I simplified it. I had a long think and, and took him and, and, and produced this other like The Tok logo was a design and he became... He, he kind of took over. And I think, weirdly, I think people just um, warm to the Tok logo. You know, sometimes things just happen. And people just warm to him, I think, more than the running man. And that was fine. You know, it's, it was great because I designed it and I liked it. And yeah, so he became, he became the, the Salt Rock emblem. Do you not drive around sometimes and all the time you see guys with stickers all over the all back the of the vans? There's one guy yeah. that lives by me and he's got the Salt Rock logo, sort of this shadow shape on his bonnet. It's it's crazy. Yeah. I, but, I, but, I, but I, what I also find, and I don't know whether you do, is because you, we live in a holiday destination yeah. as well, you find a lot of people that don't surf or, you know, even own a surfboard. Yeah identify with it as well so yeah. you get people in the midlands and we call them mainlanders yeah. have the gear and yeah. the stickers and they're all over the cars and stuff like yeah. that i mean that must be quite a nice feeling as well to know that it's not just people that identify with yeah. the chosen lifestyle of surfing but everybody all over the place is is identifying with the brand as well 100 percent. um you know even again even though i'm not connected with salt rock now i still get immense amounts of pleasure um seeing what's your artwork it's my artwork seeing i even see some of the old graphics like you know the original designs i mean we made them well back then because the t-shirts some of them are still going and i see people wearing them and it's it, you know it takes me back and it's like yes yeah, definite sense of pride um and seeing the you know i know people have got the running man tattooed um the top man tattooed um you see them on vans it's great I mean, what's what's not what's not to love? You know, it's fantastic. I'd like to know where your passion and stuff comes from from this. So, if we go right back to the very start, and yeah. you know, you you were born in Zimbabwe yeah, with your brother. Right. So, yeah. so talk a little bit about you know where you were born, where you grew up. Yeah, um, sure. All the way to the point of the creation. So, yeah, born in Zimbabwe, left when I was two, so I don't don't know much about the country. And my parents, we moved to Durban. So my brother and I, we grew up basically on the beach in Durban. It was obvious that we were going to be, you know, we, we were going to be attracted to the sea. Um, I started, well, we, we both started surfing. I was eight. He was nine. Have you been to Durban? Do you know? I've not been to South Africa, okay. no. Okay. Um, incredible. You know, Durban beachfront, a couple of miles of just perfect groin, just groin waves. So it's beach breaks with, with peaks and sort of almost points breaking off the front of the groins. Um, so, yeah, I... I, I just grew up from the age of eight living on the beach as a surf rat, as well as my brother doing a bit of traveling. We were young, but we managed to get lifts up and down the coast and surf and living the life. And then when, so when I was 12, 
um, my parents dropped the bomb and um, my, my dad essentially was in big corporate business and um, he just had enough and they made the decision to move um, inland which was you can imagine you know both of us growing up little surf rats and then it's like okay we're moving three and a half hours away from the coast and they moved up to a place called Underberg in the mountains and my dad took up pottery and started doing pottery he was a very talented guy um, which was great but we were sent to boarding school so I was like a fish out the water you know um, sent sent to a boarding school three and a half hours away from from the ocean I then both my brother and I hatched a plan and when we were at boarding school basically what you had to do is you had to sign release forms for the weekends so weekends you'd get your parents to sign a form that would allow you to go back to their to back home for the weekend and then drop off so we'd forge the signature hide in the bushes wait for it to get dark and then hitchhike and I've only just realized that I was about 12 13 when I was doing that I thought I was older but I was 13 but it was insane you know we used to um, like I say wait for it to get dark and then hitch the three and a half hour journey down to Durban sleep on the beach surf the weekend and then hope to God we didn't get caught when we got back and we used to turn back you know used to get back to boarding school sunburnt nose I mean but we, we got caught we got caught a few times and back then it was you know you got caned so you got six of the best but it was worth it you know so I spent most of most of the time doing that and then um i remember uh, th that lasted until i was about 15 so when i was 15 the headmaster spoke to my parents and said look you know ross is just you know he's he needs to be by the sea he needs to be you know he's he, he loves the surfing he's, he's, he needs to be by the sea so i was moved then down to durban school to a boarding school but at least i was by the sea again and um, yeah, carried on surfing. Brother moved down to Durban, and then when we were, we did a lot of lot of trips. So a lot of time spent surfing the south coast, the north coast, wave rich, lots of opportunity. I did competition, surf competition. I was pretty heavily into it, but never really. I never really um, was. Ta I was taken more by the travel than than the competition. I liked the competition, but I the thing that really um, that I really got off on was discovering new waves or, or 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 going up the coast and finding a perfect point break you know and and getting really good pumping waves and so I left the competitor I, I, I did quite well with the competition but it just I think you're either born to to do it or you're not and for me it was it was something I did but not not a passion the passion was the travel you like you're saying people do have a competitive drive I mean I've compete I've competed in in surfing competitions previously I'm not. I wouldn't say I'm a good surfer by in my in my head. Yeah. I'm I'm not a good surfer in, in imagination. But yeah. I entered a few comps, but I just I just didn't like it. Yeah. You know, I, I grew up playing playing rugby, and to the point where I did it because I enjoyed doing it. But when it yeah. started getting serious, and yeah. there was like an element of like you either do this yeah. or you're not playing. Yeah. I'm like that. Ah, fuck you. I'm not doing it. I just did it because it was fun and I liked that about it too. I did enjoy competitive surfing, but the thing I didn't enjoy was missing out on really good waves up the coast, which sounds ridiculous. But, you know, they'd have competitions in Durban where it would be two, three foot and up the coast would be four to six foot and pumping. And I, that kind of did, did my head. You know, I was like, really? Um, and I just enjoyed, for me, that it, it was more the crack you know going with my mates it was the it was the journey as well as the surfing it was so much fun and competitive surfing I found was not as much fun I <clears throat> as a complete um, comparison opposite to me um, Martin Potter was somebody I surfed against in, in competitive surfing same age he grew up on the beach next door to me and what a machine you know Martin Potter world champion and he was just driven not to say he didn't enjoy the adventure and the travel but he was focused on you know, I mean, he was next level as well. There was a definite distinction between the level of his surfing to everybody else's. He was a machine. He was a competitive machine. And look how well he did. And, and he was focused on it. And um, that's all good. But I, I was kind of more down the, I preferred the exploring and the travel. Um, 
which kind of led us really on to when I was 22, my brother was 23. That's kind of the reason why we left South Africa was that lust for travel in South Africa became a global, you know, let's, you know, my, my, my bedroom walls plastered with all the posters from the magazines of, you know, Mexican pipeline and pipeline and um, Indo and Australia. And it's, it's, it was like, right, even though, like I said to you at the beginning, even though you're living in such a wave rich country, that's, it's more about the culture and meeting and, and learning and surfing different ways. Mundaka and all these things were just like, oh, I want to get to them. I'll, I have to surf them. Um, so at 22, well, before um, we before yeah, we sure. go on the travelling bit, yeah, no worries, carry on. Sorry, I'm just going. <laughs> no, no, it's good. You know, what what were some of the most iconic memories that you remember from that period where you were travelling with your brother? And there must have been, you know, you mentioned Martin Potter. That, that yeah. there's some real, really good South Africans that came out, yeah. you know, during the 80s and 90s. Yeah. Yeah. Iconic people. There must have been some really good people that you know were in your peer group at the time. Yeah you know, that actually made it quite big, but went from, didn't do what you did, and went traveling and stuff, actually, you know, stuck with the competitive side of it. Yeah. Uh, so there's three questions in this. Okay. Who was kind of the people that you surf with that made it? Where were the, some of the best places that you surfed while you were traveling up and down the coast? And the third question, I've completely lost my track probably of thought. You'll you probably have to remind me anyway. Yeah, so let's go with those two to start with. Okay, so... Durban was just a, a cauldron of talent. There were so many incredible surfers that didn't make it on the on the big stage. It was actually difficult for them at the time um, to make it on the big stage. But you know, I, I spent time in the lineup with Sean Thompson, Durban boy. Um, again, Martin Potter, Mark Price. You know, all the all names. I mean, Mark Price went over. You know, went over to the states. Lester Signelli, uh, a lot of these guys actually migrated from into industry as well. Billabong, Quicksilver, and and over a lot of them went to America or Australia or wherever they went. So a lot of a lot of a lot of talent. the The general level there was just so high. Um, even even guys that didn't compete. I mean, I grew up at a within Durban. You got you know all the different but all the different breaks have got names dairy and bay of plenty which is famous and i grew up on a beach called the wedge and the wedge happened to be the only the only beach in durban really that had um had a, a reef and it was hence called the wedge small little takeoff super hollow left and right but you know the, it, it was very local and but the talent was just incredible you know those guys that were surfing then they could have made it on the you know they 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 were that good that they could have made it but they were it was kind of like a working class break and they you know they 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 were they had jobs and but the talent was just i guess i guess it's because you can almost surf 365 days of the year there you know even on a bad day you can find waves so you can constantly get in the surf that's kind of the problem you have in this country yeah yeah i mean the consistency here is not great but the people that live by the sea if you're in that environment where you're constantly in all the time it's like it, yeah. the, the the way i use the analogy is if you're a football player yeah. right you start playing football you can't expect to be a professional football player yeah. if you're going once or twice a month yeah. to play football yeah. it's not going to happen yeah. but if you're there every single day yeah. two or three days a session you can go before work lunchtime yeah. You're gonna you're gonna be a good standard regardless of whether you're competing or not. There are very few days that you couldn't find somewhere to surf, and even if it, you know even if Durban itself was flat, you know chances are you could go south or north and you'd find you'd find a wave. You know you could just go um, places like Cave Rock or the Bluff. You know there'd be there'd be something there'd be you know it would go further up south and yeah there'd there'd, there'd be waves so your time in the water absolutely right is through the roof and you'd be surfing three times and some board shorts you know you're not you know you, you, winters there are not really a thing you might wear a spring suit but you know in durban sure when you get to up you know towards jeffrey's bay it gets cold you know and we're talking different but in durban it's tropical so um yeah your your, your time in is is incredible so that produces a lot of good surfers so that the average level of surfing there was through the roof and then you know, then you had these other guys, and the, the you know, the the ones that 
the cream that rises top like the Sean Thompsons and Martin Potters, they you know, they did it on the big stage for sure. But there's also guys, you know, just below that that were you know, whether it's luck or, or, or whatever or bad luck, they, they, they had the talent to go there, but it, it just didn't you know, didn't happen for them. But yeah, really, really insane to, to, to grow up in that and share share waves with like like I say with Sean Thompson. You know, how do you find the cultural contrasts between South Africa then? So the cultural contrasts from when you grew up before you started traveling to your your time traveling around the world and to this country. Are there similarities? Is there a big difference? Because obviously you, you've been here since, you know, the 80s. Yeah. You must have seen the evolution of surfing to where it is today with loads of people in the water to one or two in the lineups yeah. you know how's all that how's all the change affected you or how have you seen it change in the uk in the uk or just yeah. in general um uk especially i mean I, I again i remember um vividly when we so it kind of just switching back to when we started salt rock um and for two years we were in penzance then we packed our bags and we moved up to North Devon and I remember driving along the road above Saunton and the surf was pumping it was it, it was middle of winter we didn't know where we were just following the road and Croyd was at the end of it fine and we went across the top of Saunton and it was just stacked just perfect it was empty there's hardly anybody in there went around the corner into Croyd and it was it was four to six foot offshore just a frame peaks and they're about 10 guys out that was it you know that that was it it was pumping and there were 10 guys out and we had the best time met we met them all obviously you know we turned up and and they were like you know where are you guys from and it's south africans what are you doing that was great come down the thatch tonight and let's have a beer went down the thatch had a beer been mates with them ever since but more to the point it was if that was happening now, if that swell was now, it would be, you know. So we've seen it since, like like I said to you, when we started Salt Rock, it was embryonic. We could see, you know, we could see where it was going. But yeah, it's gone through the roof. But it was obvious it was going to, you know, globally surfing, surfing's gone gone nuts, you know. Everybody, everybody surfs. Not talking about the lockdowns, but I think the lockdowns have, have, have definitely brought to people's forefront, you know, about being outside and... Yeah. You could argue it's it's a good thing and a bad thing for for retail and industry. Yeah, yeah people are buying boards and yeah. stuff. But for for those of us that well, would I call myself a hardcore surf? I don't know. I mean, I get up at stupid o'clock in the morning to go yeah. surfing. So okay, I could identify like that a little bit. Um, it's 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 more difficult now to find cleaner waves with nobody out. You do have to go searching for it or traveling a little bit more to yeah. do it yeah you do it, it it's um is it a bad thing is it a good thing it's just the way it is isn't it it's, it's the life. way it is it's, it's, life. It's, it's life and surfing has become you know it's a great sport so i haven't got any more reason i haven't got any more right to be in you know pumping croyd as anybody else it's it's it you know it's everybody's game everybody's right to be in there and if it's something they enjoy and especially with lockdown and, and, you know, it's something that's good for their head and good for them, then you, you can't knock it, can you? It is it is what it is. You know? 100%. Um, and, and, and I'm specifically, I think, you know, this summer is going to be busy. 100% it's going to be busy because of what everybody's been through. My frame of mind is I don't care how many people are in the water. I really don't. It doesn't bother me because everybody's been so desperate you know people have been locked up in cities and whatever you know um i've been fortunate to live here and i can surf other people not so fortunate so let them have it you know you, you can't you can't look at it any other way i don't think um, no i think you definitely got to formulate an attitude these days where you can't get pent up about things like that it's like you know it's you, you could almost use the analogy of lineups these days are like motorways in this country Everyone's got a car. Yeah. Everyone's got a surfboard. Exactly. They want to come on holiday yeah. to use the beach. Exactly. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah. But I think we're in a very unique situation where we use the winters to their fullest. We go and yeah. find those reefs sure. and stuff that are a little bit more out of the way, but yeah. you know, have a little bit more impact because yeah. you know we want to 
surf performance waves or, or whatever, you know, we want a little bit more of a rush than the beachy, you know. Um, so, uh, you know, there's lots of counter arguments for everything. But at the end of the day, like you're saying, people are out there to enjoy it. And I think these days, 100%. if you're going to get pent up about some, I'm going to use emmets and grockles and kooks yeah. and stuff like that, you can't really use that anymore because... I'm going to probably get a lot of shit for this, but what is a local these days? Exactly. Because travel is yeah. is so... You, South Africa, for instance, yeah. it's such a big country. Yeah. And traveling there, you can travel for days yeah. and not see anybody. This country, you know, you can't do that. You know, we're literally, what, a thousand miles long, if that? So... I'm I'm of the opinion. I mean, I'll I'll always get my ways. I'll, I'll find somewhere. I'll, it, it, you know, it's, it's, it's not a problem. I remember after the last lockdown... I remember the swell was pumping. It, it was it was absolutely perfect, but it was so busy. It was really busy, but it had a really nice, weirdly nice vibe out there because you could tell that everybody was just desperate to be in the water and just get some some peace of mind, you know, and just get in the sea and get some salt on them, you know. And yeah, it was kind of it was kind of cool, you know. It's like I sat there and just going, yeah, this is this is good, even though it's busy. They sent they seem to be a good sense of order people weren't being you know dickheads and being you know aggressive they were it was just chilled even though it was super busy and i think it was just the fact that people have been locked up for so long and appreciating the fact that we can all get in the sea and yeah you know um, i think that's the way to that's that that should be people especially this summer is just share waves it's only a wave you know just chill just enjoy it you know everybody's got the right let's go back uh so you were 22 years old and you go and traveling with your brother. Yeah. Where were some of the first places you went to and where were the best places? So Mundaka, um, Mundaka, epic, um, really, really good. Um, we, we did, we did the, first, the first places we traveled to um, when we were in Penzance, it was Europe and Morocco. Um, so we did, we did Europe, Portugal. Um, I landed up getting absolutely mashed at a place called Kosher's um, halfway through the trip. Um, and took my collarbone out um so that kind of put a bit of a stop to my surfing for a gnarly place yeah yeah i got i got ragdolled big time the swell went from zero to hero and i i was just a moment of lack of concentration and i got flogged um landed up in in a local hospital and um yeah anyway it, it, it rained they were going to operate they were going to pin me it rained and they cancelled the operation because there was water running down the in the inside of the hospital. <laughs> and they um, they said, right, the other option is if you sit on this chair, and um, and I and, and there was a bit of a obviously communication because you know my Portuguese I didn't have any, and and there was nobody that could really speak English. And they said, right, this is the other way. And they they sat me down in the chair and said, right, you put your arms like on the side there. And these two nurses appeared and just held my arms down. And they just strapped me up, and they just they pulled they pulled the bone because it popped out that way, and they pulled it over, pressed it down, strapped it up, and just sent me on my way. And they said, you know, it'll it'll come right. Um, so I avoided getting a pin, and and so now it's kind of sticks, you know, it sticks up, and yeah. Do you know what? I'm not surprised that you're saying that. So I, I did a surf trip to Portugal to Ericeira a few few years ago, yeah. and there's a quicksilver shop. And uh, we were sat having a having a beer outside, and they've got like a little skate ramp down yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, this guy rocked up with his missus and his kids. Kid must have been about three or four. Yeah. Must have been his birthday. He had some new pads on a skateboard, and his dad must have been a skateboarder, you know, back in when he was yeah. a bit younger. So he comes down, and his missus is sat there, and the kids like he's showing his kid how to do, um, you know, drop him. Honestly, he's there for about five minutes put his board on the edge of the of, of this bowl. It was only literally like knee to probably between knee and waist high yeah, yeah, just to drop in. Yeah. Went down it, flipped out, put his hand down, snapped his arm. Like it was an it was an open fracture. So luckily I was there with some uh, some medics. Um were part of our were part of our group. And we were just sat there and we were drinking we're going, he's not moving. He and he went like all pale. Anyway, so Went down, helped him out, you know, giving a bit of reassurance and yeah. stuff. And they called an ambulance. They rocked up some quite portly 
even though uh, paramedics turned up. Yeah. They put the the uh, the stretcher into the bowl, right? Yeah. Tried to put this bloke on, gave him no pain relief. Yeah. They're trying to lift him up. Man, he was screaming. His yeah. kid, I felt so sorry for him because his kid was on the edge of the bowl, like lying down, arms yeah. folded, look peering over the edge, yeah. watching his dad getting absolutely <laughs> nuked <laughs> by these paramedics. <laughs> his missus was going absolutely yeah. nuts. Yeah. And we were like that okay, they're going to get him on the stretcher, but how are they going to get him out of there? Because yeah, yeah, yeah. it was really steep either yeah. side. And I was like, oh my yeah. God. But anyway, we had to do like a three-man lift and, yeah, you know, yeah. get him out there in the end. But something very similar. They gave yeah. him no pain relief for it, literally yeah. put him on and sent him off and that was it. It was, it was, I, all I remember is getting it wrong. Then I remember nothing other than I was on the rocks and I came round and my brother and some other surfers were talking to me. And I mean, it could have been a lot worse. It could have been my head. So, and, and what they said was, um, I just got picked up and just thrown, just ragdolled in the air and just landed, landed on the rocks. It's all, you know, it's pretty rocky. Yeah. Landed on the rocks, out, Sparko, and then came round. Luckily, it wasn't my head, but it was my collarbone. And then, yeah, um, they couldn't operate because there was a storm. And... Yeah, so I spent a, a bit of time strapped up with it healing. I met a really interesting guy from New Zealand, and he gave me a squash ball, and he just said, "Right, just you know, to to keep to help build it up, just squash that ball all day long." So yeah, part of that journey through. But then I landed up surfing when I got to Morocco. So that was that was our, our surf trips um, when we came over it was through Europe and Morocco. Did did that bit, um, and then and then we started to. When we when we started Salt Rock, then it was a lot of Mexico, um, fair fair amount of trips to to uh, Next Bar in Mexico, um, and other places around the world. Yeah, it was good, good 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 journeys. How good did travels. you find Morocco? Because that must have been the days where there wasn't so many people about. Um, and wasn't so I haven't been up. back since then, and I've been told that it's really built up. All I know is that we were camping with probably roughly 20 other surfers on the top of mysteries oh really and it, was, it was camping yeah and i think it's all changed yeah from what i've been told you can't do that but yeah uh, it's all built up I've so done, i've done a few trips down there now i mean the first time the first time i went it was you know quite built up there's a lot of surf, surf skills there yeah, surf and, skills. and tagazoo is you know the stereotypical yeah. surf town that's built on the end you know just in from anchors yeah yeah, that's where we were, that's where we were based is is around there, and but we were just camping. Yeah. But with all of this, I always find is, and it's the same for around here yeah. too, is that once the size of swell comes through, it kind of sorts the men from the boys out yeah. anyway. Because, I mean, you, you know, you were talking about the end of um, one of the first lockdowns. Yeah. There was loads of people in the water, yeah. but out of all those people in the water, how many people are actually catching yeah. rideable exactly waves? That. So, exactly that. you know, yeah. you, you're sat 100%. in the right place and yeah, yeah. because you've yeah. got your knowledge. And and I was going to say it's knowledge as well. You know, there's, there's, if you've got the knowledge, that's why I say I, it, it, it never stresses me because I've surfed, you know, especially Croyd and, and all these beaches long enough. You, you, you know, I've surfed long enough. I know you can see when a set's coming, you know where it's going to go, you know what, what's going to happen, you know. So you've got, you've got the jump anyway. So I guess that's probably why I don't stress that much. But also, to be honest, going back on that lockdown i just enjoyed to see the fact that people were happy yeah. and people were getting in the sea and it's really nice you know because you knew um how much trouble and strife you know people have been through so you can't knock it you know um but yeah so um morocco i haven't been back but we camped and i think it's changed um but we did um we went down we went south went into down sahara um and just don't even ask me where we surfed because I have no idea, but we we just surfed places. We found places. So again, it was that whole, it, you know, that whole thing about just discovering stuff and finding stuff. Not that we discovered anything that hadn't been surfed, but it was just a an adventure, you know. I, I always it. find that surfing has always been for me. I mean, it's a bit different now because I've got yeah. a family and mortgage, house, yeah. work, yeah. all that sort of thing. Has always been about the travel for me. You know, I, I, 
you've been to Indo, Australia, yeah. New yeah. Zealand, mo mostly Southern Hemisphere places, yeah. Yeah. especially when I was younger, you know, I, I, I religiously went there. And you can see the you can see the change in it, but I think with society and, and culture, you don't necessarily have to do that. But I, I think if you use that as the the escapism, yeah. and there are so many places around the world, yeah. and, I, and I've used this before. I, there's a there's a book that I read called The Blue Mind, and it basically talks about and and, and uses uh, scientific. A little bit of science behind it yeah. about why, as as a human race, we end up building societies next to the sea. Yeah. There must be something for it. Yeah. And you know, if you live inland, yeah. when you go on holiday, you want to go on holiday that's got a swimming pool yeah. or is by the sea. You know, wh why do we do that? Yeah. Uh, and there's definitely there's definitely something to that. There's definitely something as a human nature to yeah. to draw you to the sea. Yeah. And I think if you do take surfing up as as your chosen lifestyle or sport yeah. or your, your getaway. Using it to travel takes you to some of the most wicked Unre places unreal. on the planet. A hundred percent. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. I mean, I, I, one, of, one of the weirdest things I ever did was I, I, um, I got to know some beach boys in Bali and yeah. they were from, um, from G-Land yeah. or from a couple of villages yeah. around there. And I just went on an epic trip with them. I ended up living in the jungle yeah. for, for like two or three yeah. weeks, yeah, yeah. surfing yeah. some absolutely massive g land that was well out of my league yeah, yeah. but i still did it yeah. you know and those sort of stories is what's it's about but that's exactly what it's about and and again that's why I, i'm not knocking the competitive side i think it's i mean i i watch i watch wsl as more than anybody else i love it i love watching surfing the level of surfing and and how it's progressing i get off on that big time just not my bag i i to do it myself i did it for a period i i, I get off on on the travel and the culture and the, you know, yeah, the adventure. I love that. Um, always have. Um, and, and so, yeah, I, I think from a young age, that's even, even when I was, you know, ducking out of boarding school and, and having to hitch down through the night to get to Durban to sleep on the beach. Oh, I mean, that was such an amazing time. The experiences, you know, the lifts I would get, the different, people that would you know give us lifts and where we'd, it was just crazy sleeping on the beach and yeah i mean it's it, it, it's an adventure itself you know and it was certainly for a 12 year old you know it was crazy but I, I loved it and but at the end of the day the end goal was scoring perfect waves you know waking up first person and you know we, we were always first out because we were on the beach so we out, had two hours surf before anybody else turned up it was brilliant and and that's what you know i guess everything was gearing towards the fact that we would leave South Africa at some point to travel, to see the world. Um, and that's what we did. So. so let's move on a little bit. So you said at the very start that the reason why you stole, started Salt Rock was because it funded the travel and, Fun, yeah, and, and the sure. surfing lifestyle. Yeah, so when did you realize that you actually had something and you, you thought you and your brother... We haven't mentioned your brother's name, Angus. Angus, Angus. Angus yes. There we go. We've got to yeah. put his name in there yeah. somewhere, yeah, right? He's, he's, he's legend. He's, um, yeah, we've, I mean, we've stuck together for a long, long time. He, um, yeah, he, very different to me, um, but we get on really well as a partnership in business. It's, you know, we understand each other um, and we've been on lots of really good trips together, not just business trips um, through Salt Rock times, but, you know, surf trips. Um, yeah. Um, so when he, did you when yeah. did you feel like that between both of you that you felt we've got this brand it could go somewhere and could make us some money when did you realize that you know you kind of if you can use the term made it um i guess i guess we saw when we had moved up to north devon and we you know that that's when it really started to ratchet up um and sales we started to supply we got a salesman and we started to the business started to expand yeah i i think it was i don't i can't put a date on that but it would have been probably maybe 88 so maybe five six years after that when we started um salt rock had when we started in 88 about six years after it really started we started getting into a lot of independent stores you know it started to really go and also weirdly our reason for starting no longer became as viable because 
the business started to expand, we started to employ people, and subsequently the theory of we're doing this so that we can travel became a little bit smaller, the, the, win, you know, the travel window, because you have obligations now, you know, you, you, things change. So you can't, we couldn't do it to, in the, right at the beginning, it was easy, you know, you, you, you'd work and then disappear for the winter. So I guess for the first 10 years we were doing that, maybe, but, but then it started to get big, you know, and it's, you, you, you can't afford the time, as, you know, that's how, that's how these things roll, right? You just couldn't afford the time to, to go off and spend months away. We could still go away for, you know, a week or two weeks or whatever, but the month-long trips in Mexico, you know, three months or whatever, those were kind of, can't do that. You know, I've got a business to run. You've got, you know, we've got suppliers. We've got shops that we supply that are expecting our product. So the whole dynamic changes. So I'd say in answer, probably about 10 years after, you know, we, we suddenly went, oh, okay, this thing's getting quite big. You know. So you kind of touch it on a little bit, and I and from your like persona and the way that you're talking about it, it's almost kind of like fast forward 10, 15, 20 years, it almost kind of feels like from talking to you that you kind of lost your way a little bit with it. Do you feel that? Um, uh, no. Or it lost it lost its main purpose is what I'm really trying to say. What? Well, I mean. The whole journey of the whole salt rock journey was incredible. It was really the last. It was the last when we got investment into the business. When 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 investment came in two thousand and ten, so the crash two thousand and seven really affected us heavily. It was it was big time. I mean, you remember global implosion. It was a bloodbath out there. Um, you know, as far as retail goes, we had grown a pretty good retail um portfolio i don't know how many stores we had then but probably let's call it say 10 whatever um and yeah it was difficult times 2000 so that was 2007 2010 we um we it was so difficult it was painful from 2007 to 2010 was the most the darkest i know for my brother and for myself and for a lot of our employees, the darkest years. It was so hard to keep afloat, to keep going. Um, we had rents, you know, we had, we had uh, because we had grown our retail, we had rents that we had to pay um, and landlords weren't budging. It was, it was tough. So we actually called it and went into administration. We just, it was just, we, we cannot carry on. There was too much pain throughout the whole business, you know, from top to bottom, too much pain. Um, but investment came in and we the, the business continued which was awesome however from my brother's point of view and my from our point of view the direction of the company had changed was changing and it wasn't where we had set out um, the salt rock story you know it wasn't where that we had set the journey to go and it's just the way it went um, it's a fantastic company, but it's just we were on a different direction, um, and subsequently Threadfin, um, you know, all about sustainability, recycled, um, our love for surfing, our passion for the ocean, and that's really why Threadfin's been born, and we, um, you know, we left Salt Rock uh, just because it it went in a, it just went in a direction that that um, yeah we 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 weren't on the same on the same path. Um, but it's that's life, you know. That's the way that's the way it goes. Especially when, I guess, you get investment into a company, you know, um, things can things change. And um, it wasn't, you know, the edges get a bit softened, and things, you know, it becomes a bigger commercial entity, and and that's fine, and that's that's good. And I and I and I genuinely wish Salt Rock the the all the best and i know my brother does i love the brand absolutely love the brand i would do you know we started it you know we absolutely we're still love next the brand. door to it and we're next door to it <laughs> but we we're on a different journey we're on a journey that we feel very very passionate about so well let's talk about that because you know we, we've moved on to it so you left um salt rock in you and your brother left in 2019 yep. is that right and you've started this new brand now, uh, Threadfin, which is all about sustainable clothing and it's all about the environment. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. So um, it's it's all about recycle. 
uh, recycled um, garments um, and sustainability. Um, and also my brother, particularly as the, the factory that we work with, we've got a long history because it's actually a factory that we used to do, we used to work with through Salt Rock. But um, Angus has been working very close with them and um, helping them to in, install things like water treatment uh, and, 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 and all the bits that you need to have a sustainable factory. And it's about looking after looking after the factory you know paying you know paying a, a, a fair price for what for what they do so it's from top to bottom um thread it, it, it's a small you know it's a, it's a small brand um but much like salt rock salt rock started in the garage thread is is small it's a small collection um but we aim to grow and we aim to learn as well um but at the moment it's based on it, it's all recycled um it's all su- sustainable um, even down to, for example, the um, the poly bags. You know, the bags that you um, get your garments in. Well, we use a starch bag, so you can. It's compostable. So everything that we do, we we're thinking the whole journey and and doing the best that we can from the get go, and then and then grow it and and learn. It's a. I think nowadays it's not about. You know, I think people are very open to to sharing um, information. Um, the Patagonians of the world and that you know they, they're not trying to hide anything from anybody it's all about we're all on this journey together we're all trying to make a difference no matter how small so you know we've started with recycled we started with starch bags and we will grow it and continue to go down that because our passion is the ocean passion is the ocean how we look after it so as I said um, the water treatment from screen printing and from the garments being dyed and washed um, the water comes out clean on the other side of the factory that we use and and i'm really proud like i said my brother's actually worked with with the guy who's a personal friend of his to to get that factory to that point and actually you know being part of the journey not building it himself but but running through it with him and and making sure that it all comes together so yeah um that's that's thread fun it's three weeks old so <laughs> you know three weeks is fine um wow. Without sounding like a really cheesy geek, I remember when you put that out, and I think I messaged you the, messaged you the day that it came out, didn't I? Yeah, yeah. And I was like, oh, what, how long is this? Been? Yeah, it's a, yeah. It, 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 we started today. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, so... It, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it, it's, it's really cool. It is cool, and it's, it's it, you know, it, it's exactly the same. I feel the same with how I felt with Salt Rock, where I can do what I want, and we can do what we want, and because it's such a young brand graphically i can do what you know we're we're in a position where we can do if you don't like it then that's fine whereas with salt rock the way it went and this is just a lot of companies they get to that commercial size where there's this you can't do certain things you know because you might offend people or whatever it's it's life i get that um but the beauty about threadfin is it's a it's a new journey we can do what we want um i can design what i want um, and we have the freedom to 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 steer this company however we want. And I think that's what we found at the latter years of Salt Rock, when the investment came in and things were, you know, we were no longer decision makers. Um, we were part of the decision, but because we had investors in, you no longer um, have the last say. Um, and I get that, but we were both definitely feeling that we we needed to to go on our own journey. It was time to time to part and um and start the thread fund journey yeah but that's really cool that you're able to identify that in yourselves as well because you know starting something brand new whether it's a new job moving to a new place the the idea of doing something like that having a lifestyle change is really scary for people sometimes too and it's really difficult for people to get out of that yeah and because they almost live in their own I'm, I'm using this as a, as a broad analogy now. It's hard to get out of that bubble. But, when, but once you realize that actually it's your own mentality and, and self-worth that's tying you into that, you, don't, you could literally just drop everything now, walk out that door, go and do something else. But it's your own personal worth and yeah. your and own... And also security, I yeah, think. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah there's that... There, there's that there's this kind of fuzzy security thing where, you know, you're kind of comfortable where you are. And yeah, I, I agree with you. And it was, there was, like I say, 
there was a lot of pain. There was a lot of pain um, at the at at the end with Salt Rock, just just because of where it was, um, and I'm talking about the 2007 crash, um, and and that that really left a mark. You know, that was that was hard going. That was and not not and for everyone, um, through like I say, all our employees, supply chain. It was really tough. I don't think people realised just how. I mean, so many companies went under. Right, we're lost. We're we're fortunate. We came through the other side. Um, but then we'd built the company. It, it, it was a great company. So the investment came in, which was fantastic. But along with that came, a, you know, it was not the direction that we had um, envisaged at the beginning for Salt Rock. So it was time. And yeah, it was really big choices, really, really hard to, you know. But but like I say, um, now with Threadfin, it's, it's almost like the beginning of Salt Rock days. It's exciting. We can, you know, got that freedom. Um, well, you've got your cafe as well. Got the cafe as well. And this new well. area here, which has got a children's yeah. play area. Yeah, and stuff exactly. In. Yeah, and, and so between leaving Salt Rock and starting Threadfin, we just we focused on the cafe, um, which is and the, the key, cafe in key, ca- key cafe in Braunton. Key cafe in Braunton, which does incredible um, food and music nights, and uh, is licensed, by the way. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, but yeah, it, that, that was a really good, um, I guess, challenge to take our mind off things. You know, just nothing to do with anything else it was a very different this is completely different to anything my brother and I have ever done um and so it was a good a good thing to get into just to you know focus on something different for a couple of years but all the time we we were talking planning and setting things up for Threadfin you know with with the factories and the and the product and the graphics and design and and all that so we had that bubbling in the background whilst focusing on um Key Cafe yeah What's the key bits of advice you would have to somebody that, that wants to start up a clothing brand and what were the stumbling blocks that you found were like the key areas that you... I think I, I would I would say the most important thing is, you know, you've got to follow your... No, no matter what, I, it, it, the one, one bit of, uh, of advice is it would have been so easy for us. Those beginning days I told you about where we were laughed out of the shops, so easy to just give up. Because you, you you know you, there's so many walls being put up, people saying no, I've never heard of your brand. You just got to believe in yourself, believe in your passion, believe that what you're doing is right, and you will get there. And like when we walked into these shops and we had doors shut on us, and look at the quicksilvers of the world and the billabongs that we've got, and who are you? We never heard of you. Yeah, well, you know, confidence and and belief that. In a couple of years, you will know about us. You know, it, it's about sticking to your guns, I think, and just believing in what you're doing. Um, that's that's the biggest bit of advice I can give. It's just self belief, believe that you can do it, and it is right, and uh, nothing's going to stop you. Have you found leaving Salt Rock and starting Threadfin and running the cafe has freed you up a little bit more to do what you initially started out to do? Surf more, do what you yeah. want to do. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. Um, definitely, um, I'm surfing. I'm surfing a lot more. Um, there was a, there was a period of with with Salt Rock, especially where it was it was huge. You know, so you know, I mean, not huge and compared to Coca Cola, but it, you know, for us it was a big company. You know, twenty million, twenty something million turnover. It's a big company, and, and of course you've got obligations. You've got you know you, you've got to be res- you know, responsibilities. And I had a team of designers and. Um, awesome designers great team but you know surf's pumping and i'm i'm getting i'm getting itchy you know and i've sat in the design room going it's coming it's low tide and it's like four foot and it's cooking and it's like, well, yeah it's, it's it's yeah tough tough call you know you've got to make some excuse to get out to get in the sea but yeah it's um mate we've been going for about an hour now so oh. what i'd like to tie this up with yeah. is uh, a little bit of a quick fire round so the first question for the quick fire oh round God, is if you had one surfboard fin set up for the rest of your life, yeah. would it be single fin, twin fin, thruster, bonza, or finless? I'd probably go twin fin. Yeah. Twin fin. Yeah. Favorite surfer and why? I really like John John. Um just I, I like his style. He's got all the tricks, but he's got the he's got the power as well so he can mix it up in my book really well see if morgan siblet can uh knock him out yeah and he goes to margs in, yeah, yeah, in a week yeah or so. but i think john john's just got a he's got a good mix of 
his his power hacks and his you know he's got some style yeah the first surf movie you saw first first one oh it might have been something like um was it bunyip bunyip dreaming, bunyip or, dreaming. yeah oh, do you remember nice. that yeah, Jack McCoy's. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think like, it might have been Bunyip or... I had the box set. Did you? With yeah, all the Jack awesome. McCoy films. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Really good. <laughs> the last surf film you've seen. I think it might have been... What was the um, Bethany Hamilton one called? She's incredible. But yeah. um, the Bethany Hamilton movie, not not the not the most recent. There was a film done about her. It was a couple um, of years ago. Yeah, 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 yeah. I watched it with my, my girl surf. And um, they were just, we just had it on repeat. So that would be the last film. I mean, I'll watch, you know, video all the time and stab and, and whatever. You yeah, know, yeah, 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 yeah. But that would be the last film I watched with them. Yeah. The best person to share a lineup with? I like hanging with this girl, Claire, that I surf with. She, yeah, it's good. It's good fun. Yeah. She longboards and it's cool. Yeah. The worst person to share a lineup with? Oh, yeah. I'm going to say my brother. And the only reason being, is because he's he's kind of he's too laid back and I see opportunities and I get really annoyed with him you know and it's I love surfing with my brother but he's he's kind of opposite to me I'm frothing and he's just like yeah and I'm mate yeah you know, opportunity go go and you know he's just like chilled and just he's complete opposite super relaxed so it kind of I love surfing with him but it I get frustrated you know because I just see so many opportunities going missing around him it's what are you doing? <laughs> I feel you on that one. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes I'm like, like, what are you doing? You should have snagged that yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. But like, I mean that. I mean, that I, I do love surfing with with Angus, but yeah, um, it, I, I just come out a little bit like, because I, I, I see the opportunities all around him, and he's just, he's just chill, man. He's just taking it all in. Very different to me. Positive and a negative in that answer. Yeah, man. yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. If there's one place you could surf for the rest of your life, where would it be? J Bay. Ross Thompson, thank you very much for joining me on the podcast and it's been amazing talking to you. Thank you very much for having me. It's been really, really good. Thanks. And that's it. Tune in next week for a friend of the podcast, Andy Cotton, where he's talking about his big wave antics over in Nazare from last year and through to the beginning of the year. So tune in for that one. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.